Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to a new episode of the Thoth Hermes podcast. Today is Sunday, May the 10th, 2020, and this is going to be episode 19 of this podcast, which is in its season four. My name is Rudolf, I am your host, and I'm greeting you from the outskirts of Austrian's lovely capital, Vienna. Our guest today will be Rachel Pollack, and who knows Rachel Pollack knows that we are going to talk about tarot, and this is why this episode is also subtitled Imagining Tarot. I am very happy to welcome you all here on the Thoth Hermes podcast. I hope you are doing well in those difficult times that we're all going through. I hope especially that you are healthy and safe and that this is also true for your beloved ones. And to all of those who are in sorrow, who have problems to go through, I'm sure the whole Thos Hermes podcast community is compassionate with you and is thinking of you. Well, today, um, as I said, we are going to talk tarot. And I'm sure that's a subject that you have so far also been rather missing on this podcast. I don't know why, actually, because it's such a central topic to what we talk about here on the Western esoteric tradition. Well, it's been about time. If you want to go back and listen to all previous episodes, well, you know what you do. You go on your favorite podcast provider or you go on the Thoth Hermes website, which is www.thoshermes.com. That is T H O T H E R M E S dot com. You will find all episodes there back to season one. This podcast has existed since April 2017, so it's been quite a number of about 60 episodes that you can get there. And as this is the case, as the number of episodes is really increasing, uh, some providers. I will have to retire maybe season one soon uh, from the podcast service that they offer because, well, there is no room there anymore. And as you can find all previous episodes anyway on the website, um, I encourage you to come to that website and listen there if you're missing very early episodes on your provider. Okay. Um, we are now approaching, by the way, 100 hours of episodes. Isn't that something? Well, not too bad. Also on the website, you can give me some feedback. And those of you who know me and who have given me feedback know that I really like your feedback and I really try to reply to each one of you. I think I haven't missed anyone. Well, if I did, I'm sorry, but uh, it was not intentional. Um, so your feedback, you can send it either via a voicemail on that very website I mentioned, or you can go to the contact form that you will find there. But of course, you can always do that also on Twitter or on Facebook on our accounts there on the Thought Service podcast account, as well as on the YouTube account where you can leave a comment. And if you prefer just simple email, that's even better. It's info at thoughthermes.com and I'm happy to receive your messages. Okay, um, we're up to 25 patrons now. Well, that's been quite an increase over the last two months where we started off at 8 and we're now at 25. Still, only 1% only of, uh, of you who is a patron. Well, 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 yes, we have 2,500 listeners each week. That's great. 25, and I'm grateful for each one of them. Thank you, 25 patrons. But I'd be happy if there'd be a few more 
you know, as a patron, if you subscribe on Patreon, you can also ask your special questions to our guests in advance. And those questions will be answered only in the Patreon special version of this podcast. And in the future, we will also have some more extra features in season five. I will start also doing some special episodes with discussions and features and roundtables. And at first, it will always be the patrons who will get access to that and the other ones later. So you might consider that it's now the right moment to become a patron. There is, though, a special treat that I have to offer to you this week, this coming week on Thursday. I will issue a special episode, but I am not telling you now what it's going to be. Well, you will have to stay till the end of the show. And after the interview with Rachel Pollack, I will, of course, let you know what that special treat on Thursday for everyone and for free, of course, will be. Okay, so some music. This week, I've decided to uh, play again music from somebody I really like and from somebody you seem to like because I got uh, lots of nice comments when for the first time I played his music on episode six in season four, Master Wilburn Burchett. Um, Master Wilburn Burchett is a California former mail order mystic, but he is also uh, a musician and he has a very special way of approaching music and of uh, thinking what music is for within the occult world, within the spirituality. And he teaches people to listen in a very special way to music. And he also wrote his special type of music uh, in order to have examples for that type of music. And you, he mostly plays with his guitar and some other instruments. And you really like that in episode six, I played three pieces there. On episode 12, I played you one other piece from him. So 6, 12. I missed 18. We'll do it on episode 19, that is today. And we will perform three more pieces today by Master Wilburn Burchett. And those three tracks you're going to hear are from his CD, which is called Open the Seven Gates of Transcendental Consciousness. So the title is a program, isn't it? Well, we only play the three first tracks, so we will only open three gates of transcendental consciousness here today. But you might get interested and might go on his uh, website, maybe just Google Wilbur Brochette, but you'll also find all about it in the show notes and get the whole CD and the others he has there. It's really worth it. It's lovely and very inspirational music. So we're going to listen to the first track now, the first gate of transcendental consciousness and this is called dawn of awakening enjoy
Of Awakening from Open the Seven Gates of Transcendental Consciousness by Master Wilburn Burchett. I hope you like it just as much as me and many other listeners here on this show. Okay, now we are going to New York, New York State, and we are going to meet there with Rachel Pollack. Somebody has called Rachel Pollack the Grand Dame of the Tarot. And when I told her that, she was laughing. But she really is. She has been a prolific writer, but not only in the world of occultism. She is a fiction writer and uh, science fiction, fantasy, comic book writer. And she is also an expert on divinatory tarot. She's also involved in the women's spirituality movement. Her book, The Body of the Goddess, is an exploration of the history of the goddess, for example. And three of her novels have won or been nominated for major awards in the science fiction and fantasy field. But she has also written that exingulary book, 78 Degrees of Wisdom, which has been one, become one of the Bibles of tarot, especially of divinatory tarot. Tarot. And we are going to talk about all of this, about her life, how it all came to happen. Rachel was born in August 45 in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so she has been around for a while and she's also uh, recently one of her science fiction novels has been dramatized and been played on the techno-pagan feminist 
fiction website. Uh, exciting news uh, for her. And I think she's really a fascinating person. And the way she approaches the tarot is really special. She has, for example, written a book about Salvatore Dali's tarot deck, comprising a full page color plate for each card. Or she has created her own tarot deck, Shining Tribe Tarot. And she aided in the creation of the Vertigo Tarot deck. So there's lots to tell about her, but let us talk to her because she will tell us all about it and all is very interesting. We will come back in about 30 minutes and we will play a second piece of music in the interval, in the break of this interview. But for the moment, we now are off to New York and to Rachel Pollack. Here comes the interview. I'm very happy to welcome somebody very special for us here today on the Thought Therapy Pet Podcast. Uh, and I'm speaking today to Rachel Pollack. I don't think that our audience needs to be introduced to you, Rachel, because you are one of the, well, La Grande Dame, as somebody put it, of the tarot. <laughs> well, and, thank you. <laughs> no, sure. And um, uh, yes, the tarot is, but it's only one of your facets, one of your uh, wings with which you fly. Uh, but of course, it's probably the one that we will talk about most here tonight here on the Thought Hermes podcast. But do you have many other things uh, that we would like to talk about? But um, your writing, uh, your fiction writing, your your a comic uh, um, designer as well. Uh, we'll talk about all that. But before we start, um, my first question to you is uh, is how did you become the Rachel Pollack that you are today? Where did it all start? <laughs> um, how, how did that, how did, how did it come all together? Was there writing in the beginning? Did you have interest for those things like the tarot already as a four year old? Well, up to you. Where, where did it all start? Well, I certainly had interest in stories as a four year old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I recently thought, you know, it might be a false memory, you don't know, but I thought that my the first book I ever read was actually Dr. Seuss's. You know, does Dr. Oh, Seuss yeah, know? Dr. Yeah. Seuss, sure. His yeah. first book. Well, he yeah. published it years before I was born, and it's called something like, And to Think I Saw It All on Mulberry Street. Right. And it's about this little boy who's walking home from school, and his daddy told him, Now, make sure you notice something interesting and tell me. And on the way, he just does more and more elaborate fantasies. Mm -hmm. And so the whole world is filled with this incredible parade right of, you know flying elephants and rajas and and then he gets home and his father says so did you say anything he says, oh no <laughs> <laughs> and so and i think that inspired me so much that book you know because uh -huh. to me always imagination is paramount and stories are paramount yeah. and so and i was writing pretty young age it's certainly making up stories you know and always ambitious i tried to write a whole epic when i was like about eight or nine years old <laughs> i got about two pages into it <laughs> i was going to be completely plagiarized as well <laughs> i'm a comic book story <laughs> but but i just kept at it you know like in i was age i guess around 11 or so we had a little creative writing couple of weeks or so in my mm -hmm. English class in school. And and I just, New York State already at this yeah, time. New York, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I just went whole hog into that. I just, you know, everybody else was just going, oh, no, I got to go the story. They go, okay, new story. I wrote a story. I put in a folder. I put my initials in big letters, you know, <laughs> like I was a famous star. Right. <laughs> and um, my teacher liked them, but they were a little bit too dark. <laughs> already then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I was reading these stories by uh, Roald Dahl mm -hmm. and oh, yeah, right. as well as writing children's books he wrote very dark sardonic stories and absolutely they were often done on the show Alfred Hitchcock Presents um, mm -hmm. so I was writing those kind of stories of nasty mm -hmm. at the end you know? mm -hmm. and my teacher kind of was unhappy that they didn't end happily <laughs> <laughs> but, but Dr. Seuss already he is also a little bit twisted a little bit just yeah, a little yeah, right yeah. Uh, uh, and actually there was this very sad thing a few years ago I, I hope it's not I would like to think it's fake, but it probably isn't. That someone uncovered some cartoon he did when he was young, and, mm -hmm. and um, it's not that young. It was during the Nazi period, mm -hmm. and it was this, you know, horrendous racist cartoon. All oh, right. I mean, way over the top 
racist picture of a slave auction really? in America. Mm-hmm. It was disgusting, you know, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and who knows why he was doing that and how well, that happened, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who it's knows, sometimes hard, huh? hard to judge people so many years afterwards. We never know what happened to him yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he has created for for generations of young people like Green Eggs and Ham and all all, yeah. all those things that were real classics, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so writing was really there at first, right? But yeah. already with that little twist into the darker yeah. side. Yeah. But but when did you when did you realize that beyond writing or with writing there was something else like well it ended up to be the tarot, but probably there was more to that. There was something that you discovered in yourself. <laughs> well I had this great love of mythology and fairy tales. Mm-hmm. So it was always a kind of mythic level and a level of the fantastic, but not just the fantastic and, you know, sort of ordinary terms, fantastic connecting to something deeper. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and I remember in college, I kind of self-educated myself on all sorts of things as well as mm-hmm. my classes. And, and mm-hmm. the main one was mythology and its different interpretations. Okay. By different scholars, including, you know, Freud and Jung and Otto Rank mm-hmm. and you know, anthropology and, and Joseph mm-hmm. Campbell. It was a great discovery of mine. Sure. Yeah. You know, all my life I've discovered things that no one knew about. And then they became this huge, huge thing. It was embarrassing. I had to pretend I didn't, was no longer, I wasn't interested in this. I mean, like <laughs> Tolkien. I discovered Tolkien on a bookshelf when I was 15 years old. I, I, no one had ever heard it for years. No one had ever heard of it for years. The no, only that, people I knew who yeah. read Tolkien were people I told to read Tolkien. Right. That was it. Right. I was in college the first time I met someone, and in fact, a friend of mine invited me to meet this woman he was dating, and he said, "Okay, Rachel." He said, "Okay, get ready." He said, "Okay, you know, say why you're here to his friend," and she said, <laughs> "Well, I'm a great fan of Tolkien." <laughs> so he, he put us together. That was wonderful. But anyway, but um. So there was always that, you know, mm-hmm. and my writing was always underlying such things. But then right around the same time that my first story sold, around 1971, a little before that, actually, uh, I, I was teaching at a college where it was very, very cold. And this teacher said to me that if I gave her a ride home, she would read my tarot cards. I said, okay. And so that's my introduction to tarot. I don't remember the reading at all. I just remember to think I have to have this. This is so incredible. Mm-hmm. And what was incredible about it was not the, not the, so anything esoteric or anything like that. It was purely the idea that here were these enigmatic pictures. Mm-hmm. And then a book that was supposed to explain it, but was just as mysterious. Okay. And I just thought I had to have that. I mean, the card that stays in my mind was the Six of Swords and the Rider deck. So the people in the boat, where are they going? Why are they there? Mm-hmm. What are those swords about, you know? Are they right. dead? Because it looks right. like the fairy of the dead, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the book said nothing about them being dead. You know, so, I mean, you know, it just fascinated me. Uh, so I just finally got it and I just just threw myself into it. And then, and then I just... And I really, you know, there were very few books then, you know? Yeah, sure. The only yeah. books available were simple guidebooks. This mm-hmm. card means this is like four lines, you know? Or, or these very, very obscure cult books. That you had to have like, you know, years of um, study before you could read them. Because they made references that if you didn't know what the references were ahead of time, you couldn't possibly figure them out. But where so, would you find them at the time? Where would you find them in a bookshop or? Yeah. Cause, you know, cause there was some, yeah. a cult mm. bookshop. It's when mm. New York, um, Wises, you know, was there. Um, mm, yeah. Sadly, they're long gone, but you know, their books mm. was a great bookstore. Yeah. So you could find those things, you know, but you could really, uh, also it's very hard to find tarot cards. This was just before us games issued the writer deck. Okay. About a year or so. Year or two. Oh, really? So, oh, it was, okay. so before, at that point, you know, U.S. You know, um, Kaplan, Stuart Kaplan, U.S. Games, is kind yeah. of a genius, you know? Mm-hmm. An inspired genius. I mean, he saw this obscure thing that was only of interest to occultists, you know? And he said, this could be something. Mm-hmm. I could market this and make it a big deal. Mm-hmm. And he did, you know, and everything comes out. Everything that we know of the modern tower world comes from Stuart Kaplan having that 
inspiration. And for a long time, this was really the only deck that was around, right? Pretty much. There were a few others. Yeah. That, you know, mm -hmm. uh, right around the same time, there was a small press version of um, the Toth deck. Uh, the Toth deck, of course, yes. Crowley, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And then there was um, a few other things. There was a mm -hmm. few things that were spin-offs of takes on the Rider deck. A couple that were done before Kaplan did, and he either got control of them or he drove them out of business. Yeah. In fact, the deck I first started was published by Wiser's okay. under the fake imprint of University Press because <laughs> they didn't have the copyright. It was basically right. a pirate edition. I love what Wiser's does. And, you know, I'm glad he did that because I got the deck. But, you know, sure. when it was Kaplan... I had an authorized deck. They had to back off, which is a shame. It was, yeah. uh, if you ever see it, you should get it. It has an onk on the back. The okay. back is kind of pink, and there's an onk on it. Oh, right. Um, right. And it's right. very valuable. It's very special. I'm deck. sure it is, yes. I'm sure it is. must not be very many copies around yet. Yeah. No, uh, and, and I'll tell you a great story. So I, was looking, I had it, and then that, my first deck was stolen. Uh, it was stolen from my, I was teaching at the university and I left it in my office and someone came and stole it. And I was so amazed. And years later, I found out that there's this bizarre tradition that says you should steal your first tarot deck. Isn't that weird? Oh, I have never heard that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, a, it's a very well-known really, one. Well, not really. I didn't know about it until the publisher told me about it. Barbara Moore uh -huh. from uh, Llewellyn gave a speech about it. Uh -huh. She said that one reason tarot decks were under lock and key in bookstores was people believed they were supposed to steal them. Okay, uh, that's true. Even nowadays in Treadwells in London, for example, the tarot decks are behind glass. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, exactly. now I know why. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. anyway, so I was looking around for another one, you know, mm -hmm. and I was in Montreal, I think. This college where I was teaching was near Montreal. And uh, I found this like street seller and he had like a sort of little kind of kiosk selling all sorts of stuff, you know. And one of the all sorts of stuff he had was the U.S. Games tarot deck, you know? And I thought, well, you know, who knows? Maybe there's a chance. I said to, so I said, I'm looking for a kind of special tarot deck. I don't know if you've seen it. Maybe not. And, um, but it, it's, it's like this, he said, but and on the back, it's pink. He said, and then he said, a lot of people are looking for that deck. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, he really knew things. He was, uh, yeah, yeah, he understood, yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah, great. Yeah, <laughs> then yeah. I found it finally. So then uh, I still have that one. I still have the second one I got and so you kept that one. Yeah, I've had yeah. it for a long time. But you did not steal your first tarot deck. Though. No, no. no, no as far no. as I can remember, I've never stolen a tarot deck. <laughs> so the first contact really was, uh, say, in 71 it was, right? That's what you said. Um, uh, actually, it was earlier. It was early 1970, like around April of 1970. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, so and exactly, that was actually, what's that, 50 years now? Yes, it's half a century mm, yes, ago. Yes, yep, it is. Half a century. It is yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was, it was, well, it's a good good moment to do that interview then. So it's really an anniversary yeah, interview. Isn't that great? I just tell. <laughs> absolutely. Didn't know, didn't know that. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so it was the Rider Deck then that uh, what was your, fir your first that, contact? That version of it, right, yeah. Right, right. The unauthorized one by. Uh, okay. And, and, but what impressed you so much at the time? Was it the divination part or was it the imagery, just the imagery? Or did you know anything about the background no, already? No. Nothing. I, you know, I'd heard of tarot from a number of sources. One was um, the waste lamp by T.S. Eliot. So I knew it from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then I knew it from, you know, studying that. And so I was reading some of the background material and it mentioned a little bit about the tarot. And, and also it mentioned a book called From Ritual to Romance. Okay. Uh, by a woman named Jessie Weston, a scholar, in which she claimed that the tarot came from Celtic um, magical mythology. And so this has been debunked. Mm -hmm. But yeah. back then, that was a popular theory. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew something about it like that. Actually, I have to tell you something funny, if that's okay. Sure. So I have what I call the useless psychic power. If this is, I don't know what's happening until after it's verified. So it's useless. Now, and one of the examples was I was teaching uh, at a college in Vermont and a bunch of us went into the town mm -hmm. to go to a secondhand bookstore, which mm -hmm. is interesting. It had some college books, you know. Anyway, so I get there and I'm thinking to myself, you know, what would I want to find here? What would be nice to find this? Uh, okay. From Ritual to Romance by Jesse Wesson, which I had not seen in, you know, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. At least, you know, maybe longer, mm -hmm. maybe 50 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was because I taught in college, you know. I walk in and there it is. 
<laughs> really? So, well. I mean, like, cause, so it's like you yeah. use the psychic power, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Another example. I was on a train once in New York City, and I thought to myself, out of nothing, I just completely, no, no, I thought, gee, I've seen Ferraris, and I've seen Maseratis, I've never seen a Lamborghini. And I go and say, I get off the train, and there in the waiting room are two Lamborghinis. No. Okay. <laughs> and they are rare. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, I knew that about the tarot, but I knew nothing about what really what it was, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, in high school, I used to hang around the library a lot. That's where I discovered Tolkien. And I discovered this shelf of obscure occult books. Really, really heavy duty stuff, you know? Right. You know, really strong, no holds barred, hermetic, you know, occult stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I just thought it was cool. I had no idea how incredibly strange that was. It certainly was. And I think I know who did it. Um, my mother worked in the library for a while, and she really liked the head librarian, who was this very elegant gay guy. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that because at that time, it was really uncommon to ever you say that somebody was gay and my mother was kind of cool sure. you know mm -hmm. <laughs> she Good. took notice this and she told yeah, me this because yeah, yeah, she liked yeah. them so much you know yeah, she, yeah. the other people were idiots you know <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway but um, so he must have ordered these interesting books you know mm -hmm. but uh, to me they were just fun they were just like you know funny symbols to write and things I made a magic wand I took this piece of wood and wrote symbols on it you know but I, yeah. I didn't understand anything yeah, yeah so yeah, I really yeah, yeah. was when I saw that deck it really was completely unknown to me in any real way mm -hmm. and just just like I said it was so mysterious you know mm -hmm. and if it hadn't been the Ryder deck it had been a Marseille deck I don't know what it would have done because it didn't have the scenes of people doing things you know yeah it, it, it is very different absolutely the Marseille deck is, is very yeah, yeah. much uh, of course it's not academics it's the wrong wrong word but it's more it's drier it's not as inspiring I, I would think right to me yeah I understand all those people who say it's the true tarot yeah, although sure. it's not the oldest I mean the oldest tarot is different you know yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but I get that you know yeah, here's sure. something I've thought about very recently I've been writing about so we talk about the Marseille tradition because all these different versions of it, right? You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then but then there's the Rider deck, and we talk about all its imitations. Yeah. But it occurs to me that all those decks that modify the Rider deck are now a tradition, the same way all those Marseille decks are. Just because the Rider deck, you know, has a copyright and we know mm -hmm. who made it, yeah, you know, it doesn't yeah. mean that all the other versions are just you know ripoffs. No, they're not. They're different mean, people's yeah. take on the writer deck, you know. Absolutely, absolutely, then, absolutely. So it's the tradition. So there's two. To me now, there are two major traditions of tarot imagery: the Marseille and the writer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And where would you put in that in that context? Where would you put things like the thought deck, for example? Where I was just thinking the same thing, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the Golden Dawn mm -hmm. Hermetic tradition. It's yeah. not just the Golden Dawn, because Chris is. Um, oh, what's his name? Eliphas Levy. Yeah. Before the Golden Dawn. Yeah. And a yeah. tale, obviously, and, you know, and, yeah. and various other people before the Golden yeah. Dawn. But that's, it's, it's the hermetic, we can call it the modern hermetic occult tradition. Yes. You know, yes. beginning, um, well, it wasn't 1781. 1781 was talked about, but that was not the... Um, not the beginning of the real one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah not the yeah. first decks. The first decks yeah. were, I don't yeah. know, anyway. But, um, so that's the tradition in which the Golden Dawn came. And the Golden Dawn then produce the uh, Crowley deck and various others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Servants of the Light. Um, all, there's all, all kinds of smaller publications of uh, 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 Gets yeah. decks, you know. Yeah, uh, but the, 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 the Golden Dawn, what is called now the traditional Golden Dawn Tarot, is also related to the writer in parts, isn't it? Well, yeah, the writer kind of came out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, until the Golden Dawn stuff was published... Mm -hmm. uh, and somewhere like it's 1970 anyway I forget when it was yeah. a little later yeah. Um, yeah. people assumed two things they first assumed the Rider deck was what the Golden Dawn deck looked like okay so, and they also assumed and many people still make this mistake which amazes me that Alistair Crowley single handed invented the entire system of correspondences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of you know mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. astrology in particular yeah. You know, with the yeah. tarot cards, you know, yeah. and all of the Deccan cards. And they still, 
but we know that basically what he did was he adapted the Golden Dawn when he made a few contributions of his own, mm-hmm. you know, basically switching a couple of positions. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, it's the Golden Dawn system that no one had yeah. published before, you know, yeah. Yeah. which yeah. was very daring of him. Do you know about the oath they took, the oath of secrecy? Yeah, yeah sure. Where they, they vowed to be struck down dead yeah. on yeah. the spot if they ever revealed anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it was before Israel regarded published the whole material, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so Crowley published the deck yeah. under his own name with a few changes and wasn't mm-hmm. struck down dead. <laughs> and Rigardi, I guess, figured he would take a chance. <laughs> I think once Rigardi, I don't really know, but this is my speculation, that once Rigardi really determined from his research that it was not magically given mm-hmm. by spirits to this German woman, yeah, yeah, you know, he figured, okay, this, you know, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's okay to do it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. But, uh, I have a question for you because you said you, the very first contact you were inspired by the imagery. Um, you are also a, a comic uh, um, designer, a, co- yeah. a comic yeah. writer and designer. Um, is your visual view on things, let's put it that way, is that something that has also today still a great influence or big influence on the way you see tarot cards or or was that only the beginning? Well, a couple of things. First of all, to get back to that beginning moment, Mm -hmm. one of the things that struck me the very first time was this is like a comic book Mm -hmm. because there's pictures and words. Yeah. The pictures are storytelling pictures. That's the thing about the writer next to people. It's not just their pictures. That the picture, they're storytelling pictures. Yeah. yeah. Every one of those pictures is a moment in a story. Who are those people walking in front of their church in the Five of Pentacles? Yeah. Why are they yeah. in the snow? What's going on? Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. you look close there to see the guy has a little bell around his neck. So they're lepers. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. why no one let them in the church. They're lepers. You know, it was a horrible word. Anyway, so there's yeah. that. Yeah. But then yeah. still now today, I mean, so to me. You know, that same idea of storytelling is always there. And it's a kind yeah. of comic book kind of thing, you know? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely, because that's the same background probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how do you approach uh, the uh, deck today? I mean, you don't approach it anymore because you you know it so much by heart. But but what is it to you today? How has, the, has that changed? And in what way has it changed since then in the, over those 50 years? Well, you know, one thing that changes for a lot of people is when you first do it, you're really into the fortune telling thing and you have these formulas and books. Mm-hmm. And it's really strange how powerful that is. Mm-hmm. You know, I started, reading, I started reading right away. I, it never occurred to me I was supposed to study things and memorize anything. Mm-hmm. But okay, I got the card, I got the book, let's do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I read for all my friends, and they were all having affairs. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, I just, I had no idea. This was not something I suspected and then pretended mm-hmm. this, you know, it was... In the cards, anyway. But over time, you get more deeply into it, and actually, then you sort of learn more levels and depths. But you also lose some of that story. That some of that's—I can't call it psychic. It's not psychic. It's just from the pictures. And is it an innocence that you lose when you when you possibly? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You start getting more deep knowledge. Mm-hmm. But I love the deep knowledge. I'm really happy that you know. Yeah. I could look at pictures and see many layers of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But at times, I think it'd be kind of nice to just be able to go back and discover all my friends are having affairs. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you what, it's the same in in my profession. I was working yeah. for 40 years in the in the performing arts, so. I couldn't go to the opera or theater anymore without having that professional look at it. And you lose that innocence and experiencing the play just as it is. And it's probably the same for you when you when you look at tarot cards today, right? Yeah, there's that. Not just tarot, but other things too. I mean, or other things too, sure. Like, like if I watch a movie on TV or yeah. go to the movies, can't go to movies anymore, but if you watch it on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> and yeah. to me, I will see flaws in the plot. Mm. Yeah, I will yeah. see things yeah. that don't work. I will see dialogue yeah. that doesn't fit. Yeah. And I, I try not to remember not to say this because it annoys the people around me. Because they're not looking, they're not sure. looking at it that way. They're looking at it just to enjoy sure. it, you know? And of course. They don't, have you don't want to spoil eye. it for them. Yeah. <laughs> My students, I was teaching writing, they used to call me the anachronism police. Because <laughs> if the story was set like in the Middle Ages, and then someone would say something like, um, I've been tasked to find out what this, you know, it yeah. drives me crazy, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I they know wouldn't say that mean. back then. But, no, you know, the people know around me, yeah. I'm yeah. just, yeah. 
they, I mean, no, I annoy them when I do that. Yeah. I have to try not to do it, you know? Yeah, I, I know yeah, exactly that, the feeling. That's yeah, what yeah. you were saying, but you yeah, see yeah, things differently yeah. when Absolutely. you've had a professional involvement in something, yes. you know? Yes, and and to a certain extent, that's probably what happens when you are as deep into something like the tarot that, as you are, right? Is that is that the same thing that happens there? I think so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's interesting, at the same time, I have to... You know, I'm probably being arrogant because I often am, but I think that at the same time, if you, people, you and I, who have the background of something, it's not because we're special, we just have the background, right? Yeah, exactly. We learned that it. Yeah. Mm. We're also seeing things other people might not see. We're appreciating something at a different kind of level. Sure. You know, I sure. can appreciate a moment in a plot twist. It isn't just cool, but it's just like amazing because, yeah. you know, yeah. I didn't see yeah. it coming or it yeah. just, and also yeah. it fits so perfectly, even though it's hidden. I, yeah. Stuff like that. That's so wonderful. You know, yeah. I don't know, do you know the TV show Doctor Who? Yes, sure. There's a, in the modern, I've never seen the old ones, but in the modern Doctor Who, there's a two part episode set in a library in the future on the planet. And it's just staggeringly brilliant, you know, and I watch it. I've watched it like four times and I've taught it twice. Mm -hmm. And I'm just awed by it. And I, I don't know other people would be in the same way. What awes me is how they take these amazing, huge things and put them seamlessly together into one flowing story. Four or mm -hmm. five different things other people would, that would only be what they had, nothing else but that. Yeah. It yeah. just amazes yeah. me, you know, they did yeah. that, you know. So yeah. I'll appreciate stuff on that kind of level. And the tarot is the same. You know, I'll appreciate the references it makes. I'll appreciate the way you can take any two cards you know and it'll make a story and it's always open-ended because anything can come next absolutely, absolutely. You know, so you know but, but um, from 71 so we are still back then and you had your first contact and you started to buy that book and read it yeah. from the book and develop your own readings etc and how did it how did it then continue? I mean, uh, from there to being the grand dame, as I <laughs> said, there, there is still some, some path to walk, yeah. right? When, when was your, your, uh, your 78 degrees of wisdom published in 97, I believe that was, um, the, it was published in 1980. 1980, okay. And 1983, and then 97 was the first one volume uh, edition. Right, right. So I must have a, a later, a later edition. Yeah, yes. it was two mm -hmm. volumes at first, but both mm -hmm. by small presses. Mm -hmm. um, and then the small press was acquired by slightly bigger small press. And that small press was acquired by Har Harper Collins, which is one of the biggest publishers ah, in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how Comet got out to the world. But, uh, okay. But, um, well, let me tell you what happened. So. Because I got the cars, right? And I was really enjoying them, you know? And I was playing with them, and I would sit down with, like, a, a friend, and we'd go for the pictures one by one and see what we saw in them. And that was very important that day, because I, I discovered I could see things that were not there. Mm -hmm. See things that were there, but probably not meant to be there. But were there. And you mean the in, one the I mean, in, in the pictures? In the pictures, yeah. Right. The one I remember very specifically is the Ten of Pentacles. So in this uh, very strange looking card, there's these people in the archway, they're like an unhappy family, they're not unhappy, but they're not communicating very much, you know? Mm -hmm. But outside the archway is this mysterious old man, and he's wearing, he's got white hair, he's wearing this like coat of many colors. Yeah. It's very magical. Mm -hmm. And then the only people from the archway, they recognize that people are his, the two dogs. I looked at that, but this is Odysseus. When Odysseus came back, Athena disguised him as a beggar. Mm -hmm. And the only person, creature, to recognize him was his dog. Was his dog, exactly. You know? Right. right, um, right. And so that showed me that you can find stuff in those pictures that's there, but that probably was not, you know, specifically intended to be there. Do you think uh, if it is there for you that it was not the idea of the designer who, who initially designed it, but it had it in his subconscious or in his, in his Jungian consciousness know. or whatever. It's hard to know. I know that when I write mm. a novel, mm. more than when I write a tarot book, because novels you're working at, you're at different line levels, you know? Sure. Um, and then only when it's done, and I can't mess with it, I can't mess it up, do I discover mm -hmm. what it's about. Mm -hmm. And I'll mm -hmm. discover incredible things that are so glaringly obvious that I was not conscious of at the time. 
Okay. You know? Okay. Yeah. So I'm yeah. thinking it's the same kind of level with some of the tarot cards, you know? Mm-hmm. At mm-hmm. some level, the Odysseus was there, but not consciously. That's my guess. But who knows, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that started me looking at beyond just the surface mm-hmm. and beyond the book mm-hmm. that I had. And so, um, and then I was invited to a beach house for a weekend, and the woman who was there said, you know, oh, Rachel, can you teach me the tarot? Well, okay, so we spent like three days on the beach, you know, yeah. going to each card. And I thought, wow, I actually know some stuff about this, you know. It's like mm-hmm. I didn't realize. So then, then um, I was living in Holland at the time, and this was 1976, 77. I had a great writer's job. Writer's jobs where you don't have to do much work and you don't take your mind in, involved. Mm-hmm. It was cleaning a bar every day. Uh, I was fired. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'd had some health problems and I wasn't doing a great job and the guy fired me four days before Christmas oh my God. even though I'm actually Jewish it still annoyed me <laughs> so I thought mm. it was wrong <laughs> because he's, not, well. he's not Jewish he's Christian <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> anyway they needed a job you know and I thought why don't I, why don't I teach tarot cards you know this is my idea of what to do for a job <laughs> and so I went and applied for a job at the center in Amsterdam the Cosmos Meditation Center the Cosmos Meditatie Centrum great name yeah. anyway yeah. and so um and they interviewed me, and that's a great story. I'll skip over the whole story. And I got the job, and so I thought, okay, now I have to really put it together to have a, to teach stuff. So I got a blank book. I started writing down everything I knew about each card, you know. And so out of that class, I started really putting together a kind of book. Okay. And then my I was trying to sell novels, and I wasn't getting anywhere. And I thought maybe I could sell a tarot book, you know. Mm-hmm. And my novels, I always kept sending to America. And I thought, well, you know, there's an occult scene here. Maybe I can find a publisher here. So there was a bookstore I knew that was an esoteric bookstore. They sold antiquarian books and mm-hmm. old books, you know. Mm-hmm. And I went there. And I, I was friends with the guy at the cash register who was American. And I said to him, I'm writing a book on tarot cards. You have an idea of where I might sell it here in Holland, you know? Mm-hmm. He said, well, we might want to do it. It turns okay. out they decided to publish new books, you know? Okay. And so they did it. They published it, and then they licensed it wow. to the English company, and that was the start of it, you know? So you were in it's the right it, place in the right moment. Yeah. <laughs> it's never been out of print since yeah. 1980. Yeah. Uh, sold all over the world. Absolutely. In many languages now, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. How many languages do you know? Uh, you know, it's somewhere around, like, 10? No, I'm not mm-hmm. sure now. I have to, I'd mm-hmm. have to mm-hmm. stop mm-hmm. and remember and count them all up. Something like yeah. that. Yeah, well, that, that, yeah. that's a great story. Yeah. But have you, you have always published both your novel and fiction writing and, let's say, your cult writing under the same name, right? You never yeah. took a pen name for no, either. No, no. And um, was that ever a problem? No, no, never was. I mean, because the work I, the, the fiction writing I do is largely um, fantasy. Yeah, sure. You know, fantasy, science fiction, kind of a literary fantasy. Yeah. So yeah. it's never been very popular because, you know, the fantasy market, people want dragons and magic yeah, stars. And sure. The literary sure. market, people want other stuff. Anyway. It's, it's not but, too far apart. Yeah. But the point yeah. was that the audience I have is not an audience that's going to go, oh, tarot, how weird, you know? Yeah. Some will, but not that many, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And vice versa. The tarot people like fantasy, so, you know, it's okay. Yeah. But the tarot stuff's always sold better than the than the um, fiction. What a lovely woman. It was really difficult for me to find the right moment for the break here because we kept on talking and we came from one to the next. So I cut here and I will repeat the last sentence that we said when we retake the interview because that will help you all to find your way back into our talk. But for the moment, it's, as I said, time for some more music and it's again a track from that CD, Open the Seven Gates of Transcendental Consciousness by Wilbur Burchett. And this second uh, piece is called, well, after the awakening, what comes next? Regeneration. So enjoy Regeneration by Wilbur Burchett.
Generation. Track 2 from Open the Seven Gates of Transcendental Consciousness by Master Wilburn Burchett. Again, if you're interested in that music, go to the website of ThoughtsHermes.com and to the show notes of this episode, and there you will find the necessary links to get it. Right now, let's return to meet Rachel Pollack and to that lovely talk that we had together. This time, we are also going to make distinctions between different types of tarot approach and what she thinks about them. And we continue to talk about her life and her approach to things. Right. And uh, at the end uh, of the interview, there will be, as always, immediately the third track of music that we played today and the third track from this opening of our consciousness after awakening and regeneration. The third track is called Transformation. And as I said, there are four more tracks to come, but not in this episode. But for now, we are back to Rachel Pollack. But the tarot stuff is always sold better than the, than the um, fiction. Really? That's a, why do I think this is? I, I don't know. I think because the tarot world, I think I found a kind of opening in the tarot world that people had not done before. And how would, you do, how would you define that? Uh, that, that, that idea of seeing, taking two levels seriously. One level is the sort of, you know, tradition of symbolism and mythology and everything else that goes into it. And the other level is, you know, storytelling and people's psychological responses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, and I just went deeply into that. And I think people liked it a lot and still do. If you had to define other ways of, of looking at the tarot, so you just described your own, um, but there are of course other, other ways. How would you, if you had to archetype them, how would you, how would you name or, or describe those other ways? Well, this is, you know, I don't want to characterize individual people, certainly, but just no, 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 just, just, just the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, just, yeah. So there's the strict, uh, cult correspondence way for sure. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's a very major way. You know, so, obviously. which is a very tradition somehow, well, Quasi traditional, not really, but well, it's tradition very, of its, it's own. Very, yeah, it's very intellectual. Yeah, it's very um, technological. Yeah, I mean, to me, not, if people don't understand about magic. It's always a technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, um, mm-hmm. and unless it's very personal magic, which I kind of do sometimes. But okay. you know, real magical traditions are are, are scientific and technological. Yeah. And people rebel against that, but, it, you know, I'm not insulting them by saying that, just the opposite, you know, saying that there's, there's a huge background there. Absolutely. So, there's, yeah. so there's that tradition. And then there's the strict um, predictive tradition, mm-hmm. in which people are only interested in, in pre- making predictions, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then there's the, um, you know, using cards as psychic projections. Right. Which is connected to fortune telling, but it's not the same. It's not the because same. Fortune telling yeah. can be done with formulas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's that yeah. whole tradition. You know, Lynn Ramon came along a few years ago, mm-hmm. and people loved it because they didn't have to be psychic to make psychic predictions. predictions. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I realized that what Lynn Ramon is, is a set of um, algorithms. Okay. For a kind of artificial intelligence of psychic predictions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't have to be psychic to make predictions because all the rules are there. And you're not and faking it, it, you know, but the system, can, the system can, yeah. can you develop that a little bit? Because I find that a fascinating approach. I've never seen it like that. Well, if you do Lirimont, it tells you how to put the reading out, mm-hmm. where, to look, where to begin, what directions to look in, see what cards are where. And then it says things like, you know, if this card appears next to this card, it means this. And a whole bunch okay. of things like that, you know, okay. large and small, right? Mm-hmm. And so people can make, and people, I know people who do this, they make amazing predictions. Mm-hmm. With no attempt whatsoever to psychically connect okay. the pictures. Interesting. Or it, it's purely following the rules of the mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So to some extent that that's a kind of, like I said, it's like an artificial intelligence. Yes, absolutely. Is, is, that, that, particular, is that particular to Lenormand or does that same thing exist no, also in tarot? No, it's People think it is. Mm-hmm. People think the tarot is all emotional and mm-hmm. projected, but that's modern. 
If you look at tarot from the same period of mind, like 19th century, it's exactly the same. Okay. Fortune telling. Instead of formulas, it's this card was that card. You know, this, if you get two queens, it means this. Mm-hmm. You know, Wade has that. And the back of the pictorial key has some of those rules. Yeah. yeah you know, from yeah. the tale and from some other sources, you know? Yeah. yeah. Do you know the, the, the tale by Pushkin, uh, the, the, the Lady of the Spades, the Queen of Spades? Called? I've heard it. I don't think I've read it. Um, and that, that's, of course, uh, purely that time as well. And yeah. there he does the same. I mean, the whole story details about that Queen of Spades, which becomes a real person. Then, But it's technically the same as you're just saying yeah. about fortune telling. Yeah, yeah. So there's that, so there's that tradition. Mm-hmm. And then there's also um, people who just, you know, purely like, there's some people who, I don't want to sound like I'm denigrating, but what they'll do is they'll say they're psychic, but they're often projecting. Mm-hmm. Their own, their yeah. own ideas of what what something should be about. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know that at least that's my impression. And maybe I'm just being really unfair. Well, no, but I don't think you're unfair. Too, by the way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They're also exactly, and and that happens not only in tarot, but in other ways of fortune telling and drowsing or or, 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 or scrying or whatever. Yeah. Um, you have that same phenomenon, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, all these yeah. things are going on under the, the title of tarot reading. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and but so you you have concentrated on that one that you dis- described first. Um, uh, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more, if you can, if you don't want to tell me, but uh, on on that more scientific technological one, as you said, because uh, so the the old nineteenth century tradition, the golden dawn tradition, etc. Because um, I find it fascinating what you say and. I am absolutely with you that it is a kind of scientific method. Yeah. Uh, um, how would you how would you describe that a little further? Well, first of all, it's not readings. Yeah. Um, so it's purely about you know learning all these correspondences, mm-hmm. but kind of going beyond just studying them to have, be able to use them in various kinds of ways through meditation, mm-hmm. through traveling the astral world, through um, summoning spirits and demons and so on. These are so the like, past, not, so, so the past. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know my characterizations are limited because I'm not a practitioner of that. I have great admiration mm-hmm. for it. Yeah, but um, so my knowledge of what actually happens is just from reading what other people say happens with them, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I did a book on the Tree of Life, but you know who Herman Heindel was? The tarot yes, sure. artist? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So Herman did a Tree of Life painting, and he asked me to do a book about it. And mm-hmm. I said, well, Herman, I'm not a Tree of Life expert. You know, it's mm-hmm. not my field. Like, I, I know yeah. about it. It interests me. Mm-hmm. So and he said, I said, I don't really know this. He said, yes, but you know me. Because he had done a book on runes, and the artist, the publisher hired had nothing to say about Herman's art. Mm-hmm. All he talks about was the, the runes in tradition. Mm-hmm. And Herman was very upset by this, you know? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, so in the course of that book, I did some research. I knew some stuff, but to make a contribution, I did research on the tree of life in mythology, not just in mm-hmm. Kabbalah or the yeah. Golden Dawn tradition. Yeah. Um, and then I also, one of my great sources for the... Um, Golden Dawn, Alistair Crowley, particularly Crowley version, is it was a comic book called Promethea, mm-hmm. written by Alan Moore, who's the great genius of comics, and um, yeah. yeah, and drawn by J. H. Williams III and Mick Gray. Mm-hmm. And I read, I've read that entire thirty-two issues because it's cabalistic, so thirty-two is the cabalistic number. Yeah. and I read the whole thing about four times. It's just wonderful. So, okay. I mean, I do, I do that kind of stuff, you know. But yeah, but also it's not just it's not just the Golden Dawn. It's if you look at say. I you know one time I was thinking about this whole subject. And I thought, well, I thought, well, you know, okay, you know, shamanism. That's not a technology. No, of course it is. Yeah, you know, shamans study things. They have a whole, you know, they have their natural talent, right? Oh, of course. But they also have this tradition. Uh, definitely, definitely. And they know vastly more than the rest of the people around them know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just like a scientist knows, you know, yeah. you and I will be in the same room with scientists. And that person will know vastly more than we know about that particular subject. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, definitely, no. definitely. So, so there's that level at which magic has a traditional kind of technological side, in which as I said, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I say that in great admiration. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I understand. And I find it a very interesting approach. But you just mentioned shamans. And um, that brings me to my next question, because I think uh, you have designed your own tarot. Well, you, I call it your own tarot, uh, a tarot, or you, you say if it's your own tarot. Uh, the Shining Goddess, it, the Shining Woman tarot, it was called and initially. I, and then became the Shining and Tribe. And then became the Shining Tribe later on. Can you tell us a bit how that all, A, how it all came into happening? Why it changed? name at some point and what people should imagine when they when without knowing it well the second one is easy so it was done the shining shining woman and it didn't have a great success so you know without a print and then uh, Llewellyn decided you know I pitched it to them and they said okay let's let's do it you know let's do it again mm -hmm. um, and so I got to make some revisions there were some cars I didn't wasn't happy with so I re completely redrew that four cars I changed another I don't know, six or eight in some mm -hmm. way, you know, there were changes, right? Mm -hmm. So I figured a new name would help. But also I discovered that there were people who thought it was a feminist deck or a woman only deck. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was one review where this guy said that, you know, it had good qualities, but it kind of offended him. It was only for women. There were no men <laughs> why, in the deck. Why wait, did wait, you, wait, why wait did you yeah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. He said there were no men in the deck. And I thought, what the hell? There's a whole bunch of men in the deck. <laughs> there's an yeah, emperor, yeah, there's, you know, there's, all, yeah. there's all kinds of male figures. I mean, not, yeah. not a vast number, but there's a significant number. So the name just confused him into thinking him off. it was only about yeah. women. You know, yeah. it was weird. So I, so, and I thought, okay, so I'll call it Shining Tribe. So this, to me, that was yeah. more meaningful anyway. Sure, but why did you call it Shining Woman in the first place? Because the world card, to me, seemed like a goddess. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the, the name Shining Woman is actually the title of the world card. Right, the, right. Not the car, but the dance of the, the images, yeah. you know, yeah. she's called Shining Woman, you know? Okay, 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 um, okay, okay. So how that came to be, so I'm not sure, but at some point I think I just felt like, you know, people were starting to make their own decks, and, starting, and I thought, well, mm. maybe I should do that, you know, time is mm. best. You know, yeah. I've been doing this for a while now, you know? I, think, uh, I was you, actually... Was, you was can 20, draw, I mean, you. <laughs> well, here's what happened. I didn't think I could draw. I had no idea I could draw. So I thought, well, what should I do? It's like Wade did it, you know? Or like Crowley did it, you know? Yeah. I'll come up with some ideas. I'll have an artist. Okay. Right? So I did a few crude little cartoon sketches, you know? And I looked for an artist. And then I didn't get anywhere. One woman did just gorgeous, gorgeous work, but then it was too much work. So she, she was gonna start, wasn't going to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Okay. I tried a couple other people. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do. And I, want, I basically was in the comic, I was, you know, in comic books, you're the writer. You yeah. say, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. And they do yeah. that. Yeah. They'll give it yeah. their own twist. They'll add it later to it, but they're not going to change it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. if you say this person is dressed like a medieval hermit, they're not going to make it a lab scientist. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But yeah. these artists felt that they had the right to do their own picture and not <laughs> what I wanted. That wasn't going to work. Okay. Yeah. So then meanwhile, um, I was I had a meeting with, you know, Nikki de Saint Fall was? Yeah, the sure. Tarot garden. Sure. So I had a meeting with her in Paris. Yeah. She yeah. wanted a reading. And I had my prototype deck. It wasn't only... I don't know, I had probably only like about a third of the cards done. But mm -hmm. she said, let's do that one. Okay. So we did it. And it was a great reading. It really was very helpful to her. Mm -hmm. And I told this was like, you know, I was looking for an art. She said, no, do it yourself. You should do it yourself. And I said, oh, okay. If one of the world's greatest artists tells me I should do it myself, I should do it myself. <laughs> uh, she, so, she really was one of the greatest. Yeah. Yes, that, yeah. Uh, so I started uh, uh, make, doing it seriously and really trying, you know. And I discovered mm -hmm. I was, at the level I wanted to do it, I could do it. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. meanwhile, my interests at that time, personal interests and professional were in things like cave art, shamanic art, um, various kinds of really like, you know, tribal kinds of art. And this was for a book I was doing called The Body of the Goddess, which is about the origins of religion. Oh, well, I'm going to back to that yeah. a bit later, yes. So that was around the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's how a lot of the images were Australian Aboriginal, which is still one of my absolute great traditions i love that so much even though i know nothing about it uh -huh. um cave art you know yeah yeah which is a mystery but north american cave art of course um yes but from more european because it's ah, okay you know mm -hmm. the oldest the oldest and also the most developed in a certain way you know yeah certainly, the yeah. most complex art mm -hmm. artistically mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's, here's something funny. Someone once wrote to me and said, can you tell me briefly what we know about the pictures in Lascaux Cave? 
And I wrote back and I said, actually, this question is really easy to answer. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all we could do is make guesses because yeah. nobody wrote it down. Yeah. No one had any way to convey what they had in mind. Sure. So it's just open. We don't know. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Good Anyways, guess. <laughs> but I just love that art. I just love it. And yeah. I find it so fascinating. And, mm -hmm. and the guesses are great guesses often, you know, often yep. the really stupid guesses. You know, like the idea is all male hunting magic, which is just ridiculous. Yeah, you know? certainly. Um, anyway, but so those are influences. That was the stuff that I was drawn to. And so that's what I put in my pictures. Okay. And the other thing I did that was different in every other tarot deck I've heard of, but probably the other decks I did it my way too, but the ones I see, is it was not planned. I had vague idea of what kind of things I wanted, but I did not say, okay, so for the high priestess, it has to look like this. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, more to the point, really, the minor cards. You know, I, the major card there was a certain conceptualization because I was working from the tradition. Um, but so what would happen was I would just find a picture somewhere and say, oh, that's a cool picture. I'm going to make this one of my tarot cards. Mm -hmm. And I would adapt it and figure what, what card it was supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, so to me, it always had a kind of organic quality, a kind of development mm -hmm. by itself, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but what did it change for you? You said in the beginning you were influenced by the images and that taught you a story or told you a story. Now you are telling stories probably through your images to others, which are necessarily a little different from what the writer tells those same people. So what, uh, how does that, uh, what does that create? in you or what do you want to achieve with that well ideally because I'd love to be a vehicle for people to have their imaginations engaged not just by my deck but by any tarot deck mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know to me that's uh, the ground of it all is imagination as an active force you know right. in the occult tradition imagination is the somewhat denigrated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's always seen as a low level You know, yeah. the lowest level to ordinary consciousness. And then beyond that are the more important levels. Yeah. Which, which is are all abstract. Which is, and, the whole high, low thing is a very tricky concept yeah. to me, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And they, the 19th century didn't trust the imagination. Yeah. So they yeah. thought you should get beyond it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. In Promethea, he, 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 he certainly looks at that because he has to go through the whole tree, you know, step by step. Who, who was that? Uh, the comic book Promethea, how yes, more yes, designs yeah, it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he also has, you know, that um, the level of imagination just above, in a certain sense, our daily life is called the Immateria. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the moon realm, the lunar realm. And he gives it great power and meaning. He also says it's very dangerous because mm -hmm. you can lose, you can go crazy, you can get lost, you can, you know, sure, not come sure. back. Sure. But there's this beautiful moment way back, I think, in episode two. Mm -hmm. When his heroine, this college girl, this massive college girl, who discovered she can channel this mysterious being called Promethea. Mm -hmm. So she's become Promethea, and then she's this nightclub with this, um, unknown to her, this gangster um, magician has summoned uh, two demons from the Goetia. I don't even know how that's pronounced. I, Goetia, I don't yeah. Spell, mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he's sending them to kill this walk in, as he calls her. Okay. You know, and they get there. It's great because they're, you know, one of them is clearly Humphrey Bogart. And I'm not sure. <laughs> the other might be James Cagney, Richie Robbins, anyway. Yeah, But, yeah, yeah. So they show up looking like 1930s gangsters, you know, from a movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're in this nightclub and they attack this woman. She becomes from Ethiopia and they attack her. And then, um, And then suddenly she takes out a caduceus, this, you know, body length caduceus to repel their attack. And they go, and they go uh oh, she's packing heat. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then one of them says to me, You're not a walk in, you're not a demigoddess, what are you? And she says, It's beautiful. And she says, I am the holy splendor of the imagination. I cannot be destroyed. That, so to me, that's one of my great slogans in life. You is know? A, that is a good sentence. The holy splendor of the imagination. Isn't that holy splendor, yeah. The holy splendor. I have to write that down because I never yeah. heard that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Alan yeah. Moore is just amazing figure. He certainly is, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah anyway, yeah. so, but at the same time, you know, nevertheless also, his character goes up to all the other levels, right? Yeah. But to me, I always felt that that world of imagination is the primary world. Mm -hmm. So imagination creates reality for you? 
Yeah, probably. Yeah. At the same time, I feel there is a reality. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the purely hermetic principle to say that the spirit and, and therefore imagination creates yeah. the material world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've actually said I need to investigate the question. Not just through spiritual tradition, but through scientific, through modern physics. Yeah. The whole issue of why we can't put our hand through a rock. Yeah. Because yeah. if it's all empty space with a tiny few atoms, just a field. We should be able to do that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good point. Um, some of those traditions I I, I know about the Bota, this which also is a kind of yeah, non tradition, yeah, etc. Yeah. And they ask from their students to if not draw their own tarot because not everyone might be talented to not, enough to do that but to at least color their own tarot uh, with their own colors their own imagination and so no oh, no they don't that's the thing that's what's so interesting absolutely no, so you're yeah. supposed to use absolutely they colors that they tell you okay. you're not supposed to make up your own colors you're not supposed to choose what colors you think we're oh, right okay you're I didn't supposed know that. to use exactly the right colors because for them colors all have vibratory Go energy. golden dawn certainly does yeah. yes yes yeah and What's interesting too about that is those color energies are not the same as the chakra energies. Exactly. Because exactly. of the, the, the 19th century occult mm. uh, Madame Blavatsky tradition. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. In which for instance, yellow is the color of mind. Okay, so, but there are other traditions, maybe I, I was certainly wrong uh, about the Bota then, but there are other traditions which ask you to do your, uh, to draw your own tarot, let's put it that way. Um, okay. Um, what does that mean to you when, 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 when a tradition does that? Is that? I have not seen that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. To be honest, mm -hmm. I've not seen, you know, the Golden Dawn, you're supposed to copy their deck. Yeah, that's true. You're absolutely right. Now that you say it. Copy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have yeah. to say, you know, the Golden, I always have a very odd feeling about the Golden Dawn. I feel like at the same time, I have incredible respect for what they did. I just think it was mm -hmm. amazing intellectual achievement, mm -hmm. insert, spiritual achievement, imaginative achievement. At the same time, there's also this level at which it's really hokey. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. supposing, so the great story of how the deck came to be is that I think his, I may be totally misremembering this, but here's my memory, mm -hmm. that Moynihan Mathis goes into a room, or no, McGregor Mathis goes into a room with a blank set of cards, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And a certain period of time later, he comes out waving this complete set of drawn tarot cards, Mm -hmm. So he says we're given to him by magical spirits. Everybody goes, oh my God, oh, it's incredible. Wow. <laughs> and I said, how gullible can those people be? <laughs> I'm with you. Is it not occurred to them that someone has put that other deck in the room ahead of them? <laughs> I'm with you. We're, all anyway, both, we're both going to be a, cursed now. <laughs> so yeah. So, so everyone was told to copy that deck, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With greater yeah. or lesser degrees of skill. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I don't know how many, you know, I've never found out how many examples exist. Mm -hmm. I know Robert Wang had an example because he, he did his own version of it. You know, Robert Wang did that. Okay. So there's at least one version floating around for someone to copy. I don't, there must be quite a few others, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, yeah we'll you never hear so. about them, you know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I have to ask you about the book you mentioned briefly, The Body of the Goddess, it's called. Um, tell us a bit about it. So I was interested, first I was interested in the goddess movement about, um, you know, spirituality that was not patriarchal, that was not all intellectual and not all abstract and removed from mm -hmm. the physical world. Yeah. And so these things are all identified kind of, and then it was very interesting in cave art and shamanic art and things like that. And they kind of coalesced in the idea that I found from different sources going into goddess reading and stuff, that um, religion was not only older than patriarchal religion, mm -hmm. the so-called great religions beginning some four or 5,000 years ago, Mm -hmm. um, that all seem to have male, all male deities mm -hmm. and all male authorities, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that, but also that these older levels were grounded in physical reality, not right. in abstractions. Right, you know? right. And so, I did, so the research led me in this direction. It was some really wonderful material. And so I really became interested in things like landscape formations. Mm -hmm. and how they became the goddess's body mm -hmm. and certain kinds of landscapes. And I started seeing how they exist in different places and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of all. And so 
I decided to write a book about it. I just, I can't remember why I decided to write a book about it, but I just became so fascinated. And I, mm -hmm. oh, I know part of it was an excuse to make, to travel. You know? <laughs> um, I, I sometimes, I, I did a book called The New Tarot, which is different tarot decks in the 1970s, I guess. And that was an excuse to have people send me copies of tarot decks, you know? <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Right? Um, anyway, yeah. but I figured, okay, you know, if I do a book about uh, the origins of religion, you know, I look like I go to like you know, ancient stone circles and prehistoric caves if I can find any you know, stuff like that. And also these amazing places, I can claim I'm doing it for a project, you know, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so and that's what I did, you know. OK, so and a the very tribe, romantic approach. <laughs> and yeah, the Shining Tribe deck was done around the same time. Yeah. And so that's why it has a lot of that same kind sure. of influence. Sure, no, I got that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but your, would you say that your way of storytelling in your fiction books has been influenced by your occult work? Let's put it that way, to be very, to be, put it very blunt, right? Or is, oh, it yeah. rather, also, or is it rather the other way around? What, what, both. Uh, it's, it's both, actually. Both. It's always both, you know? You can't separate that, can you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the occult work, you know, definitely... I try to like keep to the traditions, you know, and also I try to ground it in kind of a pragmatic approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like in my stories, the tarot cards are much more magical than I see them in, reality. in life and in practice, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in my stories, I'll be really a whole hog, you know, all out, you know, like they're originally given by God to the first humans and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I love playing with those ideas. Yeah. But in my, you know, in my tarot practice, I try to have a more, like I say, grounded kind of approach to, you know, yeah. people. Yeah. So I feel like there's some basis besides my own pension to make everything up, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's a kind of um, partly scientific approach as well here in the, in, in the, in well, the, sure, I would say historical more than scientific, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's your tarot practice nowadays? Um, uh, how active are you and, and, and are you reading a lot for people or uh... oh, I never read as much as some people do that's their main profession because I don't mm. push it that way I also yeah. don't I think to be make it as a tarot reader you have to be prepared to do a lot of practical predictive work yeah and it's not what I do I don't I can do it, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm not that great at it. Other people are better, I think. Mm -hmm. And what I do, I think other people don't do. So I, I try to stick what I'm good at, which is to go deeper, deeper levels yeah. and connect people to spiritual energy, but also to traditions of mythology and storytelling and so on like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do a fair amount of it, you know. It comes, yeah. Some periods I'll do like several readings a week and some things I won't do any readings for two or three mm -hmm. weeks. Mm -hmm. It all depends on who gets in touch with me. Um, for a while I was doing nothing and all of a sudden it's picked up again. I think it's, people are getting used to quarantines or whatever they call it. Oh yeah. And so they figure, well, maybe I can reach out and get a tarot reading, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I see so what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing some of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that. And then I do teaching mm -hmm. and I do lectures. I go to workshops and stuff like mm -hmm. that. People invite mm -hmm. me, and, you know, yeah. there's all of that. And at the same time, I'm often writing books. I'm lately been doing books about tarot decks. Okay. So I did um, a couple so of non, non, non fiction, non fiction books. Yeah, yeah books yeah, about yeah. specific decks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't been doing too many generalized books. I feel like I've said, I've said a lot of things I wanted to say, and I don't until I come up with a really new approach. Mm -hmm. Look at that I don't want to just do another book to do another book about tarot generally. Sure. And the problem there also is a lot of people don't want a new approach. Mm -hmm. If you do something new in tarot, a lot of people say no. I. I don't want that. I want the stuff that's tried and true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. So 70 Degrees Wisdom has always outsold any other book I've written. Because that's the basic one for people. Yeah, that's sure. The book that, sure. you know, my reputation's on. That's the one they want to read, you know? Sure, sure. Anyway, um, I have to say something very funny. Uh, you know, I, 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 no, I don't have the name of the person who said this, so I'm hope, I'm not, I don't think I'm gossiping too much, but... I was on some um, Facebook group about tarot cards, you know, mm -hmm. and I guess they didn't know I was lurking there. So it felt a little funny. But someone mm -hmm. said, so what do we think of, what do people think of Rachel Pollock's book, Seven Major Degrees of Wisdom? You know, and there's some great comments, wonderful comments. And of course, there were some critical comments, which is always has to be, obviously. Sure. But this one person said, I didn't think this book was that good. I've seen the same stuff in other books. 
<laughs> and wow. if, it, if I wasn't afraid of embarrassing that person, I would have maybe contributed and said, nobody checked the copyright dates in those other books. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. That, that, that's a good one. <laughs> Very funny. That, that's a funny anyway, one, yes. Yeah, yeah, but so, like, you know, I don't want to compete with myself because also people don't want it. So I'm not going to sure. push stuff that, you know. Of course. I've been doing books about decks. I've been, and I'm doing quite a few of those, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that's I do, I do that and I teach and so that's my tarot work at the moment but I got other projects I mean various kind of things in the works I'm not sure yeah, yeah but but when you speak about talking about other decks then you mean real tarot decks with 78 cards etc uh, but do you also talk about different card decks well we talked about the normal but there are others around of course as you as you know very well um also really interesting ones do you have you approached them as well uh those free flying uh, decks let's we'll call them that not thing. really no uh, first of all the, the modern decks that are not part of tradition but just they call themselves oracle decks oracle decks right a lot of them i really don't like because mm -hmm. they're lofty Mm -hmm. You know, they say things like um, a card means um, passion or a card means, you know, your true self, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and little mind I love it because it's just like, you know, someone at work is spying on you. <laughs> That's what it means, you know, yeah, yeah, another yeah, card yeah. means um, you're going to get some money coming in the mail. I mean, you know, right. it's grounded right. in reality. You know, That's what right. I like about it. Yeah. These other decks... Some of them I'd love to picture, like, know what they say, but mm. I have, so I have, some of those I have some trouble with. But also, I feel like you can't become a real expert in too many things. Sure. And those books, you know, those are people are doing that already. So why should I jump in on it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good point. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. But I would certainly be very open to working if there was an Oracle's Act and people wanted me to work with it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought there was one I could connect to, I would do it. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and Robert Place and I are looking at some other things. Mm -hmm. including an oracle deck we put pictures of it i did a, put a reading of it i did on facebook and got a really great reaction okay uh, it's a deck mm -hmm. from way way back like 1775 i think it is oh wow mm -hmm. and it's beautifully drawn and bob mm -hmm. restored it mm -hmm. so we're looking at that possibility and maybe doing that you know that uh, sounds uh, sounds like a great idea have you come across that book peter mark adams wrote a book it's a huge book and it's called the game of saturn um oh. have you come across that yes that's about the uh, solar biscuit deck right yes exactly i have it i have not i have a beautiful solar biscuit reproduction it's, it's, it's a great book yes mm -hmm. i know and i have, have that yeah. i just i feel like i need a lot of time to do that yeah yeah, solar yeah. Biscuit deck is very interesting to me because it's it's odd You know, it's the first deck to have pictures of every card, mm -hmm. but so many of the pictures are similar. Mm -hmm. There's not that lot of variety. Mm -hmm. And also, there's all these references, all these names. And I figured maybe I'm just ignorant, you know, but apparently nobody really knows what those names are, some of them. Absolutely, yeah. yeah it's and then there's this modern take that it's all alchemical, but I'll read the book and I'll see, I'll see if I'm convinced. I, mm -hmm. I wonder if there may be, you know, I, you know, here's a great thing. You, in the great in the occult world, this is a wonderful thing that you can do, and it's it's is you can make something up about something that becomes real. <laughs> so, like, for instance, the whole you know the whole culture of tarot was totally made up. Absolutely. In 1781. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. in Le Mans Primitif, volume eight, I think it was, you know, uh -huh. and, but then it became real. It became this amazing, brilliant, wonderful thing. Imagination becomes reality. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, the people in the 19th century occultists, they did this great thing. They aligned it to existing mm -hmm. traditions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, alchemy, astrology, yeah. uh, particularly astrology, you know, the correspondences and the gold yeah. and the tree of life and Kabbalah and did this amazing job and it became real. It came to life as a real thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. But at least it's, it's a really... Very beautiful and nicely done book. Yeah, that, that's have you have you have you sure. delved into it? Have you looked at it? Yeah, yeah quite think? a bit. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what I do mean, you find in it? I mean, how does it work for you? Uh, I think it. It is very odd and very strange to me because, yeah, as you say, okay. uh, I can't really connect it to anything else. But it's extremely beautiful. I think it's Peter and Mark Adams, the, the author, does an extremely good job in explaining it and trying to find connections. Uh, it's a serious work, but it's some things are really hard to swallow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah uh, interesting book there. Well, Rachel, um, 
This has been a great hour in your company. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. I'm very much. Too. Um, great. Thank you. Um, so I wish you best of luck for everything to come. Um, okay. Keep safe in those slightly difficult times you that too. we all go yeah. through. Yeah, you too. And to yeah. else, thank you for being with us today and uh, take care. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Transformation by Master Wilburn Burchett from his CD Opens the Gates, the Seven Gates of Transcendental Consciousness. And we listen to three of those seven gates today. Thank you very much, Rachel Polak, for the lovely time that we were able to pass in your company. It was great to have you on the podcast and she was, I can tell you, so nice also in preparation of this podcast and she was much fun to talk to. I think you got the message also when you listened to us talking. Right, before we now come to the end of this show and before I am going to announce you next week's episode, I promised you some extra treat, didn't I? Okay, well, here comes the surprise. Um, on next Thursday, so that will be May 14th, I will issue a very special episode where David Beth is back. You remember David Beth, he was with me on episode 11. And on episode 11, after episode 11, both he and I got so many questions from you guys. You were very interested in that episode and you had many further questions that you were asking David. And so he and I, we decided that we would do a little question and answer episode just for him. Um, this will be a, just a very simple thing, just the intro music. I'll say hello to you. Then I will do this questionnaire with him. He'll answer and he does that in a very good way, as you can imagine. He'll answer all those questions that we selected. And well, that will that will be it. It will be no music, no other things. But um, it will be really a question and answer seance, a question and answer session with and for David Beth. And I hope that will make many of you happy. Great. And then, well, yes, and I now still owe you the content of episode number 20, which will then be next Sunday. In episode 20, I will welcome German occultist and artist Hagen von Tullien. Many of you, I'm sure, know who he is. He's a German artist and occultist, as I said. He's working in a variety of media, including pen and ink, paper cut, collage and digital formats. And his art is, of course, an expression and manifestation of magical states. Um, it's a state of awareness and also the use of magic as an esoteric tool. He was a key figure, Hagen was a key figure in the 1990s of the Illuminates of Tanateros, which is, um, of course, the chaos magic organization of the time. He was actually the section head for Germany. So a very interesting talk we had, and I'm happy to present it to you next week, next Sunday, on the 17th of May 2020. But for now, this is the end of the show. I am really happy that you were with me again today. And if it was your first time, I hope you will return. And all the others have been here several times. Of course, you have to return too. Right, and little reminder, become a patron. Okay, guys, thank you for listening. It was great to have you. And for now, I only say, take care, stay tuned, Hear you soon.